All right, Daryl, uh, welcome. I never knew TV, right? <laughs> pleasure to have you. My pleasure. Um, I want to get right into it, right? I want to talk about Otis Blackwell, who wrote Fever for Little Willie John, Breathless and Great Balls of Fire for Jerry Lee Lewis, Don't Be Cruel for Elvis Presley and many more hit songs, right? And the great Chuck Berry's unacknowledged contribution to rock and roll. Sure, they both have a lot of uh, unacknowledged contributions to rock and roll. Let's start with Otis Blackwell. Otis Blackwell was a, a songwriter and a singer, and he had a gift for putting lyrics to music. Uh, you mentioned one of Elvis Presley's songs, Don't Be Cruel. That was Elvis Presley's biggest hit of all time, written by a black man named Otis Blackwell. I had the pleasure of being Otis's musical director for three years uh, before he passed away. And uh, he also wrote All Shook Up, Return to Sender, Paralyzed, such an easy question, all number one hits for Elvis Presley. And um, he, uh, he was brilliant, you know, he, uh, he, he was an introvert. Uh, he didn't, you know, really come out a whole lot and uh, socialize and things like that. He stayed, you know, where he was and wrote songs and composed uh, music. And then one day he decided that he wanted to come out and perform again. When he first started, he was a performer, but then he figured, uh, he, he was taught by Doc Pomus, another great songwriter, that he could make a lot of money writing and selling songs, pitching songs. So he got into that and said, you know, why should I go anywhere and, and, and put all, all this hard work performing and being on stage and putting together a band when I can just write a song, let somebody else do it, and I get paid for it. So uh, Otis Blackwell was, was a wealthy man. However, he should have had twice as much money from the songs that Elvis Presley recorded. But here's what happened. Uh, Elvis had a manager. This is not Elvis, Elvis Presley's fault. This is um, the, the doings of his manager, a fellow named Colonel Tom Parker. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Colonel Parker, now, there were, you know, Elvis had other songwriters too, Jerry Lieber and Mike Stoller. Lieber and Mike Stoller were, uh, I should say, Lennon and McCartney were the Lieber and Stoller of the 1960s. Okay, but Lieber and Stoller were some of the greatest uh, duo songwriters, team, team of songwriters in the 1950s. Wrote a lot of songs for Elvis, the Drifters, um, the Coasters, and a lot of other people. So anyway, when they wrote a song and Elvis recorded it, Lieber and Stoller got 100% of the writer's royalties, as they are entitled to, right? Otis Blackwell, Colonel Parker told him, if he wanted Elvis to record his songs, he had to give Elvis 50% of the writing credit. Now, Elvis never wrote a song in his life, okay? Understand also, Colonel Parker, who was Elvis's manager, was getting 50% of Elvis Presley. Now, that's unheard of in the industry, right? A, a, an agent gets anywhere between 10 and 20%. A manager gets anywhere between 20 and 35%. Colonel Parker was getting 50% of Elvis, yes. Okay, so you write a song, you're Otis Blackwell, you write a song, and Elvis Presley records it, you have to give Elvis 50% of the writing credit. So he gets royalties for something he didn't do, and then Colonel Parker gets 50% of Elvis. So it's like 25-25. Now, you know, Elvis was not savvy to all this, and that was not his doing. But uh, that's how Colonel Parker treated uh, Otis Blackwell. And I once asked Otis, uh, you know, when we were together, uh, performing and all that, or just you know practicing or whatever, I said, you know, why why would you let them do that? He said, Daryl, you have to understand something. Back in the 1950s, it was hard for a black man to make a living, let alone playing rock and roll, because rock and roll was not accepted by the establishment, the white establishment, because it was black music, and people thought it was corrupting white youth and all that kind of crazy nonsense, right? Uh, so he said it was hard enough to make a living. Um, as a black man, you know, playing, playing this music that was unacceptable, but also 50% of Elvis Presley was a lot of money. And, you know, everything he gave Elvis, you know, went to number one. So, but he, he would have had 50% more. Now, when he, you know, he wrote Great Balls of Fire for Jerry Lee Lewis, you know, another a friend of mine, and um, you know, he, he got you know, full writing credit for that. Where did he learn? Did he ever break down? Like, I'm always interested in hearing people's writing process and also their process of becoming a great writer did he ever break that down to you no not not in specifics but you know we were talking in general 
and he, he, he had teenagers in mind, you know, America's youth. And so he wrote to that, you know, to, to that degree. But that's wild, though. Like, as he distanced himself in age, how was he still able to write things to connect with teenagers? Well, because he was a teenager himself at one time. I got you. You know, and, and, there's, and there's certain things that are common to teenagers. You know, love for one thing, chasing girls, all that kind of thing. And, you know, Chuck Berry would do the same thing. And Chuck Berry was the oldest of the rock and rollers. All right. I want to get into Chuck Berry now. He's another legend that um, is kind of, I don't want to say he's written out of history, but it seems like he doesn't get as much acknowledgement and praise as he should. That is correct. Just like, just like most uh, black musicians. Now, uh, Chuck Berry is the inventor of rock and roll. He would never tell you that, but, but he is. There was no rock and roll before Chuck Berry. Did people record songs before Chuck Berry? Sure, but they weren't rock and roll, all right? Uh, Chuck Berry, you know, I, I played for Chuck Berry for 32 years, not every gig, but many gigs. And this man was a genius. And geniuses are wired a little different than, you know, than the, the normal person, <laughs> you know. Anybody can say, you know, I played the guitar and I wrote a song and some other person sings my song, and that's great. But how many people can say I invented a genre of music? Um, like I said, he would never say that, but he did. Beethoven did. Jimi Hendrix did. They came with a whole different genre of music. And, um, you, know, back, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, black people were not given credit for, for their inventions or their discoveries. Uh, but they were used commercially by everybody. And then, you know, many, many years later, they began to start getting credit. Um, also, this, this new music that Chuck Berry invented, and then along comes Little Richard, who also contributed a lot, Bo Diddley, Fats Domino. These are the, are the creators of the genre rock and roll. Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins, Bill Haley and the Comets, Buddy Holly, and other great uh, white uh, uh, performers of this uh, genre. They're the ones who popularized it. They did not invent it, they popularized it uh, because you know, they, they had access to, uh, to more powerful radio stations. Um, in order to, to sell records, you have to be heard by the public. And black radio stations did not have a lot of wattage. You know, they're, they're exactly the neighborhood whereby these white stations, and this was you know, before FCC regulations, they could broadcast all the way across the state into the next state and so forth and so on. It was like, you know, un, unchained territory or something. So the, the wider your reach, the more people hear it, the more people go to the record store and purchase your record. Please break down your, um, the greatest life lesson and lesson about music you learn from being around the great Chuck Berry. Well, there are many. Uh, one is get your money up front. <laughs> you know, Chuck Berry was as, no, as, was as well known in the music industry um, for his business acumen as he was for his innovative music. Um, you know, he got burned uh, you know, early on and you know, not getting paid, not getting what he was supposed to be getting and all that kind of stuff. And uh, he, was, he was a firm believer in don't let the same dog bite you twice. You know, and so uh, he, he died a very, very wealthy man. And his estate is still making tons of money from, um, from royalties, you know, that, that he fought to get back and, and succeeded. Uh, also, you know, be true to yourself. You know, keep on creating. Keep on, you know, uh, be, you know be true to yourself. Don't, don't try to copy somebody else, you know, note for note. Make you have your own voice. You brought it up. And also learn, a con learn how to read and write a contract. Take, you know, take your music as business. Just like you know, if you were a plumber, you know, you have contracts, you have, you know, this, that, and the other. Take it seriously if you want to, you know, if you want to succeed. It's not, it's not just about going out there and having fun. It's a business. How has history of rock and roll been whitewashed, both in literature and in film? Sure. Oftentimes, it's um, portrayed as a white person's music. Music belongs to everybody. Music is to be shared but you must give credit where credit is due. And whites did not invent rock and roll. Uh, that's why a lot of black pictures, or pictures of black artists were not put on album covers or on 45 sleeves of the records because they didn't want the white radio stations to know that these people were black. Otherwise, you know, they wouldn't play them. Uh, you know, if you, if you had a, a, a voice 
that had like perfect elocution and diction and you were black, don't put the picture on the, on, this, on the album or the record because that way they wouldn't know. And so like people like Nat King Cole, The Platters, uh, Johnny Mathis, you're right, they got airplay. You know, <laughs> Little Richard, Muddy Waters, mm, <laughs> that person sounds too black to be played on this station. I know you grew up as an American embassy kid, right? And traveled and still traveling as a musician. You've been to over 63 countries. Um, I once heard you use a Mark Twain quote that says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, and many of our people need it sorely on these accounts, on these accounts right? Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's, one's lifetime. lifetime. All right. Um, I, I take it it's still at this number. Less than 50 percent of Americans have passports. And if they do, yes. I'm not sure if they're traveling. How much does a lack of exposure contribute to the prejudices people have in this country? Oh, 100 percent. You know, there are some people who, who, who escape it. You know, they, they have the, the foresight to say, you know, you know, you know let, me, let me look around and see what's going on. Let, let me challenge somebody else's belief. Let me, you know, my parents say that little black kid can't come over and play with us. Well, let me find out why, what's wrong. Oh, my parents are wrong. You know, there are some people who, who will go that far. But the majority, you know, they, all they know is what they know that's around them. It's, it's like an echo chamber. And when something is repeated enough times, for them, it becomes the truth whether it is or not I know, you know what i've noticed like inner city right people always say hey a person has never left the block or they've never left the city true i think because of the media's portrayal of white americans is usually that suburban vibe but your average white person has not left their neighborhood too so both exactly people are, are concentrated in a, a ideology that doesn't reflect the rest of the world that's right yeah. that's right exactly and it doesn't matter what color you are here in america most americans regardless of what uh race color they are do not travel Europeans, they travel all the time. You know, they, they call it, I'm going on holiday. We say, well, I'm going on vacation. But, you know, our vacation may be a week or two weeks at most. Their holiday or their vacation could, could be a month or two. And they travel all over the world. So they have a, a broader worldview than we do. Now, there are 195 countries in the world right now. Okay, and I've been to 63 of them. But all that travel does not make me a better human being than somebody who's had less travel. But what it does is it gives me a broader and better perspective on humanity than people who have not traveled. Because I've seen more humanity than those who have traveled. I mean, those who have not traveled. And what I can tell you, without a doubt, it's not an opinion, this is facts. I've seen it with my own eyes, I've been there. No matter how far I go from our country, the United States, whether it's next door to Canada or next door to Mexico or anywhere on this planet, halfway around the world, people I encounter, they don't look like I look. They don't speak my language or worship how I do or believe, believe in the ideologies that I believe in. No matter how much difference we may have, I always conclude that everybody is a human being and everybody wants these five core values in their lives. Everyone wants to be loved. Everyone wants to be respected. We all want to be heard. We want to be treated fairly and truthfully. And we want the same things for our family as anybody else wants for their family. If we can learn to apply those five core values when we find ourselves in an adversarial situation or in a society in which we are uncomfortable um, or unfamiliar, culture, whatever, our navigation of that situation, that society, that culture, will be much more smooth and much more positive. And it doesn't always have to, be, have to be about race. It could be about anything. Abortion, nuclear weapons, the upcoming presidential election, the last presidential election, January 6th, all these hot topics, right? You're on one side, somebody else is on the other side. Apply those values and you will have a civil conversation. You'll learn something about that person, like maybe why that person voted the way they did or why they believe what they believe, and they will learn why you believe. And maybe you can accept that from, from one another, or you might be swayed to that side, or he or she might be swayed to your side. But what it does is it opens up perspe uh, perspectives and perception and allows you to make a better informed uh, decision for yourself. 
Do you, do you think the uh, that American arrogance and also this uh, work yourself to death culture plays a role in why we don't take any vacations? Because <laughs> because I think like vacation for us is what I've noticed with other cultures is that vacation for them is exploration, right? Vacation for us since the time is so short is just leisure. Yeah. So I just want to go somewhere to sleep compared to actually exploring a, a place. Well, you know, where vacation for us. If you live in the city, you know, uh, it, inland is going to the beach, right? If you live, you know, in, in the ocean uh, resort area or, you know, ocean towns, you go to the city <laughs> or go to the mountains camping. I, I want to get into some clan history now, right? And okay. um, You're the clan expert. <laughs> you're the clan <laughs> expert. All right. Um, how did Masonic temples inspire the structure of the Ku Klux Klan, specifically the Irish and Scottish Masons. Yes, well, the Masons are they, they, they're the ones uh, who, who, that were created. That fraternity was created by the Irish and Scottish, the Scottish Rite. All right, so the uh, Klan was formed at the end of the Civil War in 1865, and some some Confederate six Confederate soldiers put together this organization. They, they, they put together to maintain the mentality and culture of the, of the Confederacy. The Confederacy lost the war, but they wanted to continue that lifestyle, that culture. So they put together this uh, organization, and having come from these six people, having come from Irish and Scottish backgrounds, and having some of them have, have been Masons, they wanted, to, they wanted it to be a secret organization, all right, and have a mystique about it, sort of like the Masons. Now, they, uh, they, Let's use, let's use a popular term, culturally appropriated. A, a, lot, a lot of the, of the Masons, you know, uh, names, they altered them a little bit because, you know, they have the grand so-and-so, the exalted this and that, the imperial, whatever. They took a lot of those things and applied different names to them for their own organization. So that was the influence. But let's make, let's make it clear that not uh, every Mason is a, is a Klan member. You know, not, not at all. You know, it's like saying, you know, every Catholic priest abuses little boys or something, or, or every, every white person is in the Klan. No. All right. Um, also, too, right, um, origins of the outfits and the use of torches during ceremonies. Okay, the outfits came from, I forgot the exact name, but I'd have to look it up for you real quick, but it's a uh, Spanish tradition yeah. where they have these robes and these tall pointed hats, a lot taller than, uh, than the Klan uses. But that's basically where, where the last incarnation of the outfit came from. Originally it was just a, a sheet and like a pillowcase pulled over with eyes cut out. And then it, and then it you know, morphed into a uniform with that uh, dunce cap looking thing, All right. and the, known as a hood. And the torches? The torches were to light the cross. Yeah. You know, they, they believe that they are a Christian organization. They're not the Christian organization. They're not Christian like I know Christians, right? But they carry the light because it's, it, they're, they're lighting the way for Jesus Christ. Now, I'll tell you a quick story. I got into a, a uh, debate with a, with a Klansman uh, one time in my car. We were riding around. I was driving. He's over in the passenger seat. And we were talking about um, why are you burning the cross? If you're a Christian, isn't that blasphemous? Isn't that sacrilegious? Well, we are a Christian organization, Daryl. You know, we burn the cross for a couple reasons. And I'd heard this before from other Klan people. I just wanted to get his take, and it, it matched everybody else's. Um, there are two occasions upon which they set fire to the cross. One is called a cross burning, and the other is called a cross lighting. A cross burning is when they take a five or ten foot cross, wooden cross, that is wrapped in burlap. The burlap has been soaked in what they call clan cologne. cologne. I was going to ask you about that clan cologne. Yeah, and uh, which is actually kerosene or diesel fuel, yeah. right? And um, they stick it in your yard. And that is that is a warning. That is the only warning you will get. And what it means, and they set it on fire. Uh, what it means is we know who you are. Cease and desist. Move out. Or the next time we come, we mean business. And they do. So that is your first and only warning. That's called a cross burning, all right? A cross lighting is when they have a rally and they have a 20 to 30 foot cross. Same deal, wrapped in burlap, et cetera, et cetera. 
Yeah. You know, and, and then they carry their torches and they march in a big circle around the cross. And then one of the leaders will say, Klansmen, halt, and they all stop. Then he'll say, Klansmen, face the cross. These are Klansmen and Klanswomen. And they turn in and face inwards to, to where the cross is. And, they'll, and he'll say, for my God, and they all repeat, for my God, and bow, for my race, for my race, for my clan, for my clan, for my country, for my country, white power, white power. All right, Klansmen light the cross. And they all close in at the base of the cross. They take their torches and they drop them at the foot of the cross and whoosh, this thing, you know, bursts in flames because it's soaked in that clan cologne, right? And so then, and then they back out and they all stand like this, like a cross, and they, that, that's saluting, you know, saluting the cross. And then they give some speeches about, you know, why whites are superior and everybody else is inferior, et cetera. And then the rally is over and they go off to the side and have, you know, um, burgers, hot dogs, you know, soft drinks, et cetera. All right, two questions. But, but yeah, but, uh, but I wanted to say what I was telling you about, about this, uh, this guy in my car. So he's explaining all this to me, you know, which I'd heard from other Klansmen, but I just wanted to hear, hear him say it. And then um, I said, but uh, you have a different, you know, you, 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 I said, you know, you have a different Jesus. Well, he said he was lighting the way for Jesus Christ. And I said, well, you have a different Jesus Christ than I have. He goes, no, Daryl, it's only one Jesus Christ. I said, no, there are two. He goes, no, there's one. I said, no, there are two. And um, he says, what, is your Jesus Christ black or something? I said, no. I said, he's not black. I said, but he's not white either. I said, I have been to the area where Jesus Christ allegedly walked, Damascus, Syria, and those parts. I've been there, all right? I said, he appeared as one of those people. And everybody that I saw there was olive complected. If anything, Jesus Christ is olive complected. But in, in all the countries where I've been, where there's Christianity, where there's Ethiopia, where there's wherever, every picture you see of Jesus Christ reflects the people of that country. In Ethiopia, Jesus Christ looks Ethiopian. He's dark, all right? Over here, he's either, you know, uh, brunette with blue eyes or blonde with blue eyes, you know? Anyway, I said, um, they're olive complected. Uh, he, was, he was olive complected. He says, well, what's your point? I said, my point is, you have a different Jesus Christ than I have. And he says, uh, well, how do you figure? I said, because you said that you're gonna light the way for Jesus Christ with your torches and setting, and setting the cross aflame. He goes, well, if you were a Christian, you'd know. Jesus Christ is coming back. I said, yeah, I know he's coming back, but that makes the difference. That's why there are two. You have to light the way for your Jesus Christ. My Jesus Christ lights the way for me. Who are you to light the way for Jesus Christ? And he got very, very quiet. And then moments later, he changed the subject. But within a few months, maybe four, maybe five months, he quit the Klan based on that conversation. And today I own his Robin Hood. What's the origin of their ideology of white supremacy? Okay. This country owned black people, yeah. owned them as property, all right? Uh, People made a lot of money off the backs of slaves. Yeah. This country was built off the backs of slaves. White supremacy and slavery. That's exactly. the foundation of the United States. Exactly. So now um, I have to free you. I have to take the chains off. I can no longer make you work and pick cotton and, and tobacco without paying you. Right? But I will never let you be my equal. So I'm going to, you're inferior, I'm going to maintain superiority. So, you know, you can, you know, you can go out here and walk around, do whatever you want to do that you couldn't do before, but you will never be my equal. You will not sit at my table. You will not marry my daughter, you know, and whatever else. And I, 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 or right. drink from the same water. <laughs> All right. So I hear that, right? But when did that apply to actual slave owners? So if the average person has no slave and they're struggling themselves, I don't understand how they can look down on someone who's outside of slavery they're in the same boat. They're just struggling in this environment. They don't have wealth and they don't own anything. In theory, you're absolutely right. And you're absolutely 100% right. But in practicality, you know, they have been conditioned to believe that they are entitled to something just by virtue of their white skin. Entitlement. Entitlement. Right. Okay. And, you know, if you think about it, let's talk about voting for a second because, you know, we're, we're in, an, in an election year. All right. The only people, and I'm not putting them down, I'm just pointing out a fact. The only people in this country who were born with the right 
to vote are white males. Facts. Right? We, black people, had to march and protest for the right to vote. Women, the same thing. All right? So, you know, that, that's why they look down upon you, somebody. All right. And also, too, man, I just want to jump back with this cross. I know people are interested in it. People don't delve that deep into it. But like, how much time does it take to make this cross? It just seems like idle time for me. Like you have to make the cross. You have to transfer the cross to the people's property. You have to burn the cross. Like how long does it take to make this big cross? To put not it long. I mean, you got, you got a team of people all working together. Yeah, not long. And, and then sometimes, you know, they use, well, if they put the cross in somebody's yard, you know, they don't get it back, right? But, uh, but for their ceremonies, sometimes you use the same, you know, it used to be a big, tall, wooden cross. You know, they go to some, you know, Home Depot or whatever, get these you know, long wood, you know, wood plates and get these long things and tie them together into a cross. Uh, now what they do, in some cases, they get iron and have an iron cross that's permanently fixed, fixated on yeah, they just wrap it in, in that burlap and soak it with uh, Klan cologne. There is a misconception that Ku Klux Klan members are usually financially poor and uneducated, right? Correct. Uh, please share some of the past presidents. And uh, yeah, please share before we get into uh, please share some of the past presidents who uh, were affiliated with the Ku Klux Klan, either uh, publicly or silent members. OK. Well, um, President Warren G. Harding was sworn into the Ku Klux Klan in the White House as a sitting president in the green room of the White House. Um, president Harry Truman had joined the Klan for a short time before he became president. He didn't like it. He got out. Um, there is a lot of um, evidence that uh, Calvin Coolidge could have been a secret member of the Klan. Um, Donald Trump's father was arrested at a Klan rally, but it was never determined uh, was he just there as an observer or was he a member? That's never really come out. And um, I doubt if it ever will. Yeah. And uh, how prevalent do you think Klan members are in present day society and corporate America? Uh, there are a silent, lot. There are silent members. <laughs> yeah, there are a lot of them. But what's more important, um, and and more that we need to focus on, are not how many clan members, but how many people with that mentality. Because not everybody with that mentality is a member of the clan. They might be a member of the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the One Percenters, the Three Percenters, the Patriot Front, the the Vanguard the National Alliance, or any number, white Aryan, uh, white Aryan resistance, Aryan nations, all these different groups. Um, so, you know, it's not so much uh, how many people are affiliated with the KKK or the neo-Nazis or whatever, it's how many people have that mentality. Yeah. And let me, you know, define the hierarchy for your listeners. A grand dragon, you know, everybody's heard the term grand dragon of the Klan or imperial wizard of the Klan. All right, so let me break it down for you. If you have a Klan chapter in your state um, and you have a chapter of your Klan in, in another state or multiple states, you may then consider yourself to be a national Klan group, even, even if it's only in two or three states. All right. So therefore, you must have a national leader. We call our national leader, who oversees all the states, we call that person the president. In Klan terminology, the president is known as the imperial wizard, all right? So anybody that is prefixed with the word imperial means that person is on the national level, a national officer. The top officer is the, is the wizard, president. An imperial caliph would be like a vice president, all right? And then you have treasurer, secretary, and all these different names, but they're all prefixed with the word imperial, all right? So now, um, they, and that person oversees the wizard oversees all the states in which there's a chapter of his or her, his or her organization, his cha clan chapter. So uh, now each state in which there is a clan must have a state leader. We call the state leader the governor. They call that person the grand dragon. Anybody on the grand level is on the state level. Dragon being the top governor. A grand caliph would be like a lieutenant governor. And you got secretary, treasurer, etc. Within the state, you have counties. And uh, the, the county leader is known as the great 
Titan. Rate level is county level. Uh, within the county, you have districts, which, which they call claverns, and you have district leaders. We call our district leaders the mayor, the councilman, the alderman, selectman, whatever you know, they call them. And uh, they call that person the exalted cyclops. And below the exalted cyclops are just rank and file, plain white color robe uh, clansmen. You know, the, when, you, when you, start getting, um, you start getting above rank and file, you, you start getting different colors on your robes that signify your rank. Green, for example, is the grand level. Purple and blue are the um, imperial level. Your work is highly documented, right? For those who want the full story, I recommend you watch Accidental Courtesy, Daryl Davis' Race in America, and read Clandestine Relationships, A Black Man's Odyssey and the Ku Klux Klan, or check out one of his many TED Talks, right? Um, the question I have for you is, which Klan member shocked you the most when you learned that they left the Klan? Probably the first one, you know. What was shocking for me, and I think, you know, the listeners have to understand this, or viewers, is this. When you Google my name in the media, it will say black musician converts X number of KKK or white supremacist people. That is not true. I did not convert anyone. I am the impetus for over 200 white supremacists to convert themselves, all right? Uh, I never set out to, I've been doing this now, 2024 now, right? I've been doing this now for 42 years. I never set out to convert anybody. All I set out to do was find out one answer to my question that had been plaguing me since the age of 10. How can you hate me when you don't even know me? Just, t just tell me how you can hate me and you don't know me and then I thank you and I move on and you go your way. That's all I want to know. But through the course of conversation, people, you know, I, I would listen to people tell me why they hated me, you know, and I'd let them roll on with it. And then over time, these people began rethinking. That don't make no sense. Exactly. And then they began quitting and giving me their robes and hoods, you know. So when that happened the first time, it's like, what happened here? You know, this is a fluke. You know, I was shocked that, you know, that somebody in a robe and a hood, you know, you don't just go to Kmart and, and buy this thing. You, you, got, you got to join the organization and you take a blood oath to become a member. And, you know, it's an initiation. Um, and that, that membership becomes your family above and beyond any family. That is your family. And when you, you know, if you get sick or you, or you are old and no, no longer able to participate in marches or rallies or whatever, you know, then you retire from the Klan and you live, your, you live out your life quietly. But if you go and then bash them and say, I renounce the Klan, I, I don't believe in it anymore, and you give your robe to a black man, People join the Klan because they don't like black people. They don't like Hispanic people, gay people, uh, white people who, who, who date or marry black people, or Jewish people. You know, that is a betrayal of your family. It would be like one of our U.S. generals, four-star general, taking off his uniform and giving it to the head of ISIS, or Al-Qaeda, or Taliban, or whatever. It doesn't happen. All right? But this person gave a black man his robe and hood. Uh, I was shocked. And then, but I, I, at first I thought, you know, well, you know, he's just, you know, he, he came to his senses. It's not what I set out to do, but I'm glad he did it. And then it began happening more and more. So then I began to wonder, because I'm not the first black person to speak to a Klansman, yeah. all right? Um, but what was it with my conversations and these people that got me results that never yielded results for anybody else? So what, you know, how was I interacting? And so I, I began to analyze that. I said, you know what, I'm on to something. I need to keep doing this because I thought I would just go around, the, go around the country, up north, down south, Midwest, west, interview clan leaders and members on, on why they hate people, write the book, and that'd be done. And now 40 some years later, here I am still doing it and still getting robes and hoods.
Uh, what's your thought about? Let, let me let me uh, wh while we're um, on the, on the topic, let me just uh, hit, you can you can read this out loud. I just got this last night. You know, I get robes and hoods even in the mail. You know, people who uh, you know well, even you know they they heard my TED talk or they saw me on on some whatever, and um, something clicked. And they, they email me and say, hey, you know, I, I've been in the Klan for blah, blah, blah. You know, um, you know, you really made a lot of sense. I, 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 I want to get out. You know, would you, would you want my Robin Hood? I give them P.O. box, and next thing I know, it's there. Yeah. Um, yeah, you'll get a kick out of this. I just got it last night. Um, let me just do it here. Just read that out aloud. All right, good evening. I just wanted to send you a short email letting you know that next week. I'm having my clansmen tattoo removed. I can't thank you enough for the inspiration you have instilled in me. Thank you very much and keep up the amazing work. Okay. I don't know this person. So, you know, this, this happens. And it happens not every day, but it happens pretty frequently. And, and uh, I, I might get into that later. But, uh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, continue with the, the break you now, the leader. Oh, yeah. So... You know, you start off as a rank and file clan person, just like you know, Boy Scouts. You start off here and you climb, you become an Eagle Scout. All right, same, you know, same thing. As a leader, um, you have power because you have people under you. All right, it's just like you know, a police department. You know, your foot patrol. You become a, a corporal, private, and then a sergeant with the police, then a lieutenant, then a captain, then chief or whatever. Right. And each higher rank gives you more people to supervise, more people that you have, you know. Um, so same thing with the clan. And for somebody who's just a regular member, um, and, and you say things to them that, that, that click and cause a cognitive dissonance, and they think, hmm, you know, maybe I'm going down the wrong path. You know, I need to change my direction. And they leave. The same thing applies to somebody who's, who's an imperial wizard or a grand dragon. Because truth is truth, right? But now here's the problem. When you, when you present that information to them, they internalize it and they realize they're wrong. But they struggle and they, and they may take a little bit longer to get out. Because when you have sat on the throne of power, you don't want to get off. Plus your identity is so wrapped up in it, you know? Exactly. And then how do you go to people and say, let's say you have 200 people in, in, your, in your chapter, and say, hey, folks, I was wrong. I, I led you down the wrong path. It's shameful, right? You, you, listen, when you have sat on the throne of power for 400 years, as the establishment has in this country, you don't want to get off. You look at our last president. He was only there four years. He thinks he's still there. That's why he's trying to come back. All right. Power is, is overwhelming, you know. So it's harder for a leader who knows the truth. You know, they, they've listened to you. They've thought about it and they struggle. Yeah, he's right. But do I want to go tell my people that he's right? Can you see Donald Trump apologizing for everything he did the last four years? Never. All right. It's the same thing. But fortunately, many of them have. They have renounced it. I found it very interesting that your pursuit of one passion, music, right, led you to find another passion. Um, have you ever thought about what your life would be if you never pursued your passion for music? Yeah, I know what it would be. <laughs> let's, let's talk about what I wanted it to be before I even got into music. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I was really a late bloomer in music. I did not get into learning music until my junior year of high school. I was 17, all right? Uh, I, but I grew up with music around me, you know, records and you know, listening to people, but I never played. All right, up until that time, I had two vocations 
that I wanted to pursue. I was always thinking ahead, even as a kid, what am I going to be when I grow up? There were two vocations that were pulling at me with equal force in opposite directions. So I couldn't move either way. I was immobilized in the middle. One um, endeavor, vocation, was uh, computers. Now, back when I was a kid, computers took up more than this whole room, right? I knew they would get smaller. Um, I never dreamed they'd get as small as your cell phone or your wristwatch or whatever, right? But I knew they would get smaller. I knew there was a lot of money to be made in computers. The other vocation that was pulling at me was espionage. I wanted to be a spy. Uh, James Bond was my hero, all right? So each, so, you know, I'm, I kept thinking for years as a kid, for years, I was thinking, how can I do both of these? You know, it, it was impossible, you know, to be a full-time spy and a full-time computer person. Today you can. It's called cyber espionage. But that term did not exist back then, right? So you either one or the other. And so I thought about people that I admired. And um, who did I admire? Two names popped into my mind almost instantly, Elvis Presley and Chuck Berry. What did I admire about these two gentlemen so much? Was the fact that they had, had made millions upon, they had made millions upon millions of people all over the world happy with their music. They had touched them, people that they would never meet, people that they would never see. Those people might have seen them in concert or seen them on TV, bought their records, but, but how many people have met Elvis Presley or met Chuck Berry? You know, but they've been touched by the music. They danced to it, they've sung the songs. I thought, you know, that is really cool to be able to affect somebody in a positive way and you, and you don't even know the person. All right, so I see, I'm gonna do music. Despite the fact that I could not even play, I, did, I was determined this is what I'm gonna do. All right, so skip ahead. Um, I went to uh, Howard University after high school, got my degree in music, and I graduated in 1980, four years after high school. And I've been a professional musician ever since. Now, to, to your question, how does somebody go from this very passionate endeavor of music to going to Ku Klux Klan rallies and whatever else? To me, it's one and the same, my passion. Because as a band leader, okay, I, I've been a side person. When I play with somebody else, I'm the side person. I'm, I'm you know, playing what, what they want me to do, et cetera. But as a band leader with my own band, um, I'm in charge. And what do I want on my stage? Well, what every band leader wants. They want harmony between the voices on the stage, whether they are the singing voices or the instrumental voices, the saxophone, the piano, bass, dr a guitar, drums, whatever. You want harmony. The only time you want dissonance is when you intentionally inject it into the music for effect. You hit some crazy note and it causes an effect. That's like, you know, you watch the movies, they play a certain dissonance to cause you to get tense, you know, that kind of thing. So that's intentional dissonance if, uh, or, or controlled dissonance. If dissonance happens randomly while you're playing, it means somebody hit a bad note or went out of tune or whatever, right? You don't want that. That's, that's undesirable, all right? So my job is to foster harmony and control any dissonance that comes into the music to, to the effect that I want. So when the gig is over and I step off the stage and now I'm out in society, I want harmony around me. It's the same thing. So I try to, to, to bring harmony around me. And these people are dissonance in my life. Um, real quick, right? Listening to you break down music, um, have you observed universal laws in music since you've been a musician so long? Because you just gave an example in regards to that. Yeah. Unity. Um, I mean, I'm not sure which universal laws you're talking about, but I'll give you an example. Two things. We, you know, we were talking about Chuck Berry earlier. Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, um, Little Richard, some of these people would not perform if somebody was going to be segregated in the audience, okay? Uh, I'll give you two examples of that, and then I want to talk about their contributions to, uh, to race relations, okay? Elvis Presley sold, well, Chuck Berry and Little Richard, they got to a point where they refused to play for segregated audiences, where blacks had to sit there and whites had to sit there, you know, that kind of thing. Um, 
these people, these rock and roll people, Elvis, Jerry Lee, Chuck, Richard, Fats, um, they did a lot for the civil rights movement. We, when we think of the movement, we think of uh, Rosa Parks, think of Martin Luther King, and many other black and white adults who, who fought and marched and protested and had sit-ins and demonstrations and boycotts in order to bring white adults together with black adults. These rock and roll people succeeded in doing that. They were able to bring together black kids and white kids. That may not have been their intention, but that's what happened. All right? Two phenomenons happened in the 1950s that we don't give credit for. Back in the day, in the 1940s, say for example, the big stars, Frank Sinatra, Glenn Miller, Tom, uh, Count Basie, you know, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn, you know, all those, Benny Goodman. Um, if, if blacks and whites were allowed to be in the same club, in the same venue, they could not sit together, right? There were separate seating sections, colored seating only, white patrons only, et cetera, the balcony for colored, whatever. You could not, if you, if you went out with your, with, with your white friend, you could not sit with him. You had to sit in the section as designated by the color of your skin, just like the water fountain and the restrooms, all right? If you cross sat, you'd be arrested because that was the law. It was a stupid law, but it was the law. And most people abided by that law. They didn't want to go to jail. But in the 1950s, two phenomenons happened. One was the creation of rock and roll, you know, by Chuck Berry and, and um, Richard and Fats, and then the, the popularization of it by Jerry Lee and Elvis and others. Um, that was the first phenomenon. The second phenomenon was when these guys, white or black, came out on stage playing this new beat, boom, boom, bop, boom, boom, bop, you know, that backbeat. Um, white kids and black kids had never heard this before. They couldn't sit still. They bounced up out of their chairs, knocked over those, you know, color signs, blacks, coloreds, or whites, whatever, knocked them over, and they're booging and dancing in the aisles together for the first time in the history of this country, right? That caused an uproar with city fathers. Police would come in, this concert is over. In the middle of the concert, not wait to the end, it's over now, because you're race mixing. People start pulling plugs out of, out of the wall, sound goes off, all kinds of crazy stuff. City fathers, like mayors, people like that, they began banning rock and roll concerts from coming to their city because it was causing race mixing. It was corrupting white youth. And understand something, in the 1950s, when these white kids were dancing in the aisles to this music on stage by Elvis, that's, that's why the, the establishment hated Elvis initially. He was playing black music. He was playing what they called nigger bop. That was, that was their term. Jungle music and nigger bop, same thing. All right. Um, when they were dancing with these black kids, understand something. They did not know these black kids. Why didn't they know these black kids? Because they couldn't go to school together. The schools were segregated back then. So you're dancing with somebody you don't even know, right? And so, and, and you're dancing uncontrollably, you know, to, the, to this new beat. I said, that's it, no more rock and roll, you know? And not just in the South, but also in the North. I can show you news footage of a mayor banning rock and roll from coming to his town, all right? So this is the contribution of those rock and roll people. While, while, adult, while black and white adults were marching and, have, and doing all this stuff to bring white and black adults together, these white and black rock and roll pioneers were bringing white kids and black kids together. And think about it like this. Those kids went to segregated schools their parents were not letting them go out and play with, with, with the little boys and girls on the other side of the railroad tracks, all right? Um, but yet, when those kids that danced with each other, you know, when they got older, they were less prejudiced than their parents. Yeah. They'd already danced with somebody that looked like you and me, right? And so they did not um, inundate their own kids with as much as they were inundated with. Yeah. So those kids grew up a little less prejudiced. And then their kids are the ones that voted for Barack Obama. Because you know, uh, black people did not put Barack Obama in the White House. White people put Barack Obama in the White House. Not that we didn't vote for him, but there weren't enough of us. If every black person, regardless of, from two-year-olds to, to adults, and, and, and every black pet 
voted for Obama, that would not have been enough votes. We needed enough white votes to get him in there. And so those are the great grandchildren of rock and roll. To, uh, to tell you about Elvis. Okay, so Richard and Chuck would not play to segregated audiences anymore. Elvis Presley had sold out the Houston Astrodome. Humongous place, right? And the stage is set up in the middle of the football field. Oh, so it's really packed, like they're using the whole... Yeah, oh, right. yeah he, he had that ability yeah, to, to sell out like that. All right. Without any internet, without any social media. Exactly. That's crazy. You know, yeah, exactly. So, um, and, and now normally what, what happens, uh, uh, you know, I saw Elvis over a dozen times. I met him. And um, it was amazing concerts. But anyway, um, the band starts playing and, and then they go into this, to this 2001 thing and Elvis comes out on stage and goes into C.C. Ryder, that's all right, mama, whatever, all right? Um, that's how it works. But the whole band is on stage. Elvis had an orchestra, he had some male backup singers, and he had some black female backup singers named the Sweet Inspirations, who were headed up by Sissy Houston, which is uh, Whitney Houston's mother, all right? She, she sang backup for, uh, for Elvis. Never knew. You didn't know that? Yeah. Okay, so anyway, uh, she had a group called the Sweet Inspirations. Sissy Houston. So anyway, um, Elvis had sold out the, uh, the Astrodome. And um, the band came on there to do a sound check or whatever. The promoter sees all this. This is in the afternoon. And tells Elvis, he can't have the black singers on stage. Can't work. Doesn't, can't work. Um, you know, he, can, can he get some, some white singers? You know, they try to find some for him or whatever. Elvis said, no. You know, where, where, um, where, where I go, they go. And guy says, well, my, my audience, you know, it's not going to like that. I, I can't have that. You know, we just don't do that here. I would say, well, then I don't play. <laughs> that was going to cost a promoter a ton of money Big to time. refund every seat, right? Because Elvis said he, he didn't care. He's not, he not going to play. Yeah. So they went to uh, Elvis's hotel room and told him, okay, fine. You know, we, you know we'll, we'll, we'll let them play with you. Now, how it was going to work is, there's a Cadillac in the, in the, in the, uh, in the dugout, yeah. right? That's going to drive Elvis across the field. The band's on stage playing, and he comes up out of the Cadillac and gets on stage and starts playing, yeah. right? <laughs> he pulls a trick on the uh, promoter. Yeah. He, put, he put the band on stage, but had the Sweet Inspirations ride in the Cadillac yeah. with him, yeah, yeah, with yeah. the top down, so yeah, everybody in the Houston Astrodome could see these black girls in the car with Elvis. Yeah. That's what Elvis did for race relations. That's, that's one of the many things he did for race relations. And uh, also, too, for our view viewers to give context, like sonically, right, what is the characteristic of rock and roll? Because you mentioned Chuck Berry creating it, right? So mm -hmm. what is the sound? What is that? How do you identify rock and roll? Okay, well, if you had a guitar or a piano here, I would demonstrate it for you. <laughs> but uh, music is, uh, you know, there, there are many, many elements into defining what, what is the country sound? What is the reggae sound? What is the jazz sound? What is the rock and roll sound? All right. Um, rock and roll is characterized, well, all these genres are characterized by their beat. Like, for example, a waltz is done in 3 4 time for people who are, you know, it's three beats to the measure. One, two, three, one, two, three. That's a waltz. Okay. A shuffle, like a blues shuffle, is dun 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 All right. A country beat is boom ba boom ba boom ba boom ba one and two one two one two one or you clap on the one and the three. Rock and roll is bum 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 is halfway between a swing, a shuffle, and straight eighth notes. It's it's rocking instead of dun 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 one two three four like that. Okay, it's it's that back beat. How long did it take for people to acknowledge it? I know people aren't great at, at uh, accepting new things. Right, because if you watch <laughs> some, early, some early TV shows uh, with, the, with the audience and Chuck Berry is on there, Little Richard's on there, whoever, Elvis, whoever, uh, certain people are clapping on the wrong beat. <laughs> they, they don't have it. Um, and also, if you watch some of the, some of the early uh, Beatles footage, their audience over, at, over, over in England are clapping all on the wrong beat. 
You know, now, of course, you know, it's, it's in our culture. We know it. But how long did it take for Chuck Berry, for people to acknowledge what he was doing? Did he ever speak about that? Uh, not long with musicians. Because, you know, musicians are always looking for the next greatest thing. And, uh, and he, he, he created it. You know, nobody can play rock guitar without, without playing some Chuck Berry. He, he defined what, what rock guitar playing was. Because uh, nobody played rock guitar before that. All right? It's like this. No matter what kind of car you drive, whether it's a, you know, Ford Pinto, which is long gone now, um, a Rolls Royce, a Tesla, a Mercedes, a Porsche, Ferrari, Maserati, doesn't matter. No matter, even a Kia or Yugo, no matter what kind of car you drive, its DNA goes all the way back to Henry Ford and his Model A and his Model T. No matter what kind of rock you play, hard rock, heavy rock, pet, you know, acid rock, rock and roll, rockabilly, all this, it all goes back to Chuck Berry. He was the founder of rock music. So, you know, it evolves over time and it expands, but there's always a foundation. He is the Henry Ford of rock music. Are, are there racist musicians? Yes. But for the most part, no. There's always an exception to the rule. For the most part, most musicians, real musicians, they don't care what color you are. It's like, can we jam together? Can we sound good together? You know, can I compliment your, you know, what you're doing? Can you compliment what I'm doing? You know, can we create something together? It sounds good. It, it could care less if you have three legs or, you know, one arm or whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, it's, it's about the sound. What, what, what can you contribute? What can I contribute? How can we blend it? I'm a musician. I spend every night of the week playing somewhere for somebody. I am the entertainer. Those people are being entertained by me. They're dancing to my music. They're having fun. I'm working. So let's just say this Friday night coming up, I'm off. I don't have a gig. Now I want to be entertained. I want to get out and do some dancing. So there's a club down the street. And maybe they have a DJ. Maybe they have um, a live band. Either way, they have music. I'm going, I'm going to dance. They got a dance floor. So I head on down there on Friday night, and uh, there's a good song playing, dance floor is full, I want to dance. First thing I do is I, I look around, see if I see an unattached woman that I can dance with. I see some lady sitting at the bar by herself, and she's like doing this in time to the song. So obviously she likes that song. I don't know her. I walk over and say, hey, would you care to dance? Sure. Pops off the bar stool, we go out on the dance floor, right? If it's a slow song, we're like this, turning slowly around on the floor. I don't know her, but I got my arms around her. She's got her arms around me, right? If it's a fast song, we're standing apart, we're shaking, whatever. At the end of the song, I escort her back to where I got her from, the bar stool, and say, hey, thank you, appreciate the dance. By the way, my name's Daryl. She says, my name is Sally. And um, I say, so, so Sally, what do you do? And she says, uh, I'm vice president for uh, uh, Microsoft Marketing East Coast. She probably makes half a million dollars a year. And she says, Daryl, what do you do? And I say, um, I fry French fries at McDonald's. What am I making? Nine, ten thousand dollars a year? Where would two people that far apart on the financial spectrum come this close without even knowing each other's names? Music. There seems to be like, after a certain period of time, it seems like music took a nosedive in regards to the quality the creativity yeah uh in the reggae genre people blame it on numerous things specifically the use of uh computers uh digit the digital vibe not analog in your space because i know you do a lot of live playing still mm -hmm. but like music in general like why do you think music has declined so, across all genres it's like you why do you think it's declined so much in regards to the quality because you put it in the hands of inexperienced or untalented people, all right? Now, I don't say that to be derogatory by any means, but you have um, sullied the waters. For example, back in the day, if you wanted to have a record um, or recording deal, a company 
had to pick you up. Warner Brothers, Sony Records, MCA, Columbia, whatever, RCA, had to pick you up. Certain level you had to be at to even get their interest. Yeah, yeah, had, had to be top quality, whatever. Now, granted, a lot of those people ripped you off too. You know, you didn't see their books. You saw what they, you saw what they wanted you to see in terms of royalties, et cetera, right? Um, but nonetheless, uh, the quality was there. They had, they had producers, if, if they didn't like your band, you know, a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of people, even the ones that you may like, that you listen to, uh, when you hear the, uh, the recordings and, and you go see them live at the club or the, or the concert hall, it may be a different band. Because those studio musicians, exactly, sometimes the, the live band is not quite as good as a studio band. Right. So anyway... Um, you know, they try to duplicate, but uh, sometimes it works on it, it doesn't work, depending upon the quality of guys in your band. Uh, anyway, so these record companies have put out the money to get these studio guys to play, because they, they know it sells, yeah, yeah. all right? Um, so, so now, you know, you're, you're putting, you're, they're putting out top quality. Yeah. Um, but now with the, with the advent of being able to burn CDs on your computer, yeah. what do you need a record company for? I just make my own CDs yeah. and sell them at my gigs the quality has gone down, right? Um, you, you don't have the, the recording studios uh, in, your, in your basement that they have at Sony Records or wherever. Um, so yeah, you, you, can, you can do a recording, you can do a decent one, it's not gonna be as good as, as that. Or, or do you have a producer that's gonna produce it? They got producers, you're engineer producing it yourself. It. Huh? I said an engineer to mix it. An engineer to mix it and then somebody to master it, right? So all these things you don't have. So, so your product, and I'm not saying it's not good, it's just not at a certain level, right? Um, you know, you, you, <laughs> I saw a, uh, back when I was a kid, I got a little motorcycle, yeah. mini bike, I guess they call them, right? They called them back then. And so um, I had to get a helmet. And I saw the best uh, ad for helmets at the motorcycle store. So I go to get my helmet. There are all these different brands of helmets on these shelves on the same rack, right? Different brands, you know, nice helmets, you know, and they were like, you know, 20 bucks or whatever. And then over here on a whole separate rack was, was um, a, a, a bunch of helmets made by a company called Bell. Bell Helmets, right? And th they weren't mixed in with the other ones. They had their own rack and d different models, of, but they all were Bell. And... Um, there was a sign there that said, um, if you have a $10 head, get a $10 helmet. If your head is worth more, get a bell. <laughs> so, you know, that <laughs> it speaks for itself, you know? So, uh, you know, do you want quality or do you want this? Um, now, this has improved over the years. Some people are making stuff, you know, that is comparable, competitive with the larger studios. You know, but when it first started out, yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, going to hear somebody sing with a band or going to hear somebody sing karaoke. I don't know if you've ever gone to hear karaoke. Everybody has their little 15 minutes of fame and they sound like crap. I once heard you say that racism is a learned behavior, right? Right. Uh, you have demonstrated racism can be unlearned on an individual level. Question I have is, do you believe it can be unlearned on a collective cultural level? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, and I've seen it happen. You know, believe it or not, I have spoken at Klan rallies and Klan meetings. I've been invited to speak there. All right. Uh, so I'm speaking to a group as opposed to individual. But not that night, but shortly thereafter, I began getting emails from some of the people who were in the Klan at, that, at, at those rallies that I spoke at. And next thing I know, I'm getting some robes and hoods in the mail. All right. But it, you know, it all depends upon how as a group, as a group, we learn things in school. We learn them in our church. Uh, there, there are three places where we get the bulk of our education. There are four, but the three main ones are our parents, because we you know from, from birth we are raised by our parents. We're influenced by whatever is in our household until we move out, right? On our own, 18, whatever age we move out or run away from home. <laughs> um, so we learn from our parents. We learn from our schools. We spend eight hours a day in school or whatever. Um, and we learn from our religious institutions that we go to, our churches, our temples, our synagogues, our mosques, whatever. 
okay? And then the, the fourth uh, place is on the street, right? But these are the three main ones where we learn. You know, we spend more time with, in these places than we do on the street. Um, we take our parents as figures of authority. So even if they tell us something that's not right, usually we accept it, especially at a young age, because it's coming from our mom, from our dad, so it must be right, they know. I also fault a lot of um, religious institutions. I'm just going to use the word church, but when I say church, it means all of them, you know, whether it's synagogue or whatever else. Most religions have some form of Sunday school, and you're down there as a little child, and you're learning, a Sunday school teacher tells you, God loves us all. God made a rainbow of different colors, and he loves every color in that rainbow, and he loves us all, right? So she's making the rainbow, uh, you know, uh, ana analogic to, to, uh, to race, yeah. right? So we accept that as little kids because it's true, because our Sunday school teacher told us, so it must be true. She's the adult. And then when we reach adolescence or whatever, we get kicked out of Sunday school up to the upper congregation upstairs where we're sitting with our parents and other adults. Here's the problem. The clergy, the pastor, the minister, the reverend, the priest, the rabbi, whatever you want to call your clergy, stops teaching that Sunday school lesson. He or she is no longer saying, we all are God's children. Because if you're in a Catholic church, he's not going to tell you to go out there and marry some Jew. Or if you're in a Jewish synagogue, they're not going to say go out there and marry some Muslim or some Protestant or some Catholic. You know, um, you, you can, but, but it's not going to happen in the synagogue. They're not going to marry you there. They're not going to marry you in the Catholic church, all right? Unless the other one converts to Catholicism or converts to uh, Judaism, all right? Um, or they're going to preach. It's okay if, you know, if, if all you white people want to go out there and marry some black people. No, they're not going to say that. All right, because what happens if they say that? Half the congregation is going to get up and walk out, and the other half is going to complain and get you fired. But one thing for sure that's not going to happen is nobody's going to put money in the collection plate when it gets passed around. You know, you brought up a great point because me and my Brasians, we have this conversation in regards to the black church and how the people dictate the message, right? So, uh, for example, if a, a pastor is saying something that's actually beneficial, mm -hmm. he may not necessarily have a crowd at his church. Mm -hmm. But if he's saying something like a but prosperity gospel, it's, it's the same thing. But it seems that because uh, leaders aren't really leading, they are contributing to the issues we have in society. Right. Because within the context you're saying, because they're not just teaching people reality, they're, they're just conforming. To to the what, the, what your congregation wants to yeah, hear. Instead of actually teaching them what they need to hear. Right, precisely, okay? Because the, the, you, know, you want to hire, a church is a 501c3, it's a not-for-profit, right? They thrive on the donations. As Christians, we're supposed to give 10% of our earnings as tithes and offerings to our church, all right? That's how the church lives, how it thrives. Um, so if, if, the, if the minister or whoever, the, the, the clergy, during the sermon, most people just they doze off during, during sermons, right? Uh, and then when the thing comes around, you know, they put in their customary one dollar and they go back to sleep. <laughs> I'm just being honest, right? <laughs> okay? But if that preacher or whatever is saying something that's really hitting you in the heart, like, yeah, yeah, hey, amen, say it, brother, Bob, you know, that, that, that sermon is resonating with you, here's $20 in the collection plate, right? And you stay awake. That's the kind of preacher the church wants because it's going to make more money when that plate goes around, all right? So what these people are doing, these, these clergy, they are putting money above morality. It used to be, you know, they used to preach money is the root of all evil. Morality, money. Now it's this way, okay? Just like the televangelists, you know, send in a dollar for, you know, blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, you know, they're driving Rolls Royces and all kinds of stuff, and you're sending in your Social Security check. It's, it's crazy. It's a business as opposed to a religion. It's a business. And, and that's what has happened. So um, I blame a lot of, 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 uh, of the fault of, of division in this country on the churches, you know, um, as well as the schools, you know, being, being hogtied to what they can teach and what they can't teach.
And, and, but and it also seems like geographically, well, I read something, the schools are, I don't know if they said they're more segregated now than they were or it's the same amount, but schools are pretty segregated in America. Yeah. Truth be told. And, and what's being taught is pretty segregated. If you, you're up here in New Jersey, so if you go to school in the North, you were taught in history class, American history, in high school, that the Civil War was fought over slavery. And that is true. However, even to this day, if you go to school in the South, you were taught, no, 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 the Civil War was fought over states' rights. Yes, that's true. But it's the state's right to own a slave. They, they just don't frame it that way. All right, this is how they frame it. All right, um, and see, you know, you, you have the, you don't see so many Confederate battle flags flying around here as I see where I live in Maryland, and I see even more the further south I go, all right? And let me tell you how I feel about that flag. Now, this is my opinion. I'm gonna give you some facts, but I'm gonna give you some opinion, all right? So let's start with the facts. Do you know where the largest percentage of white Americans come from? What their heritage is? No. What would you guess? I'll have to go with like England or Ireland. Okay, so you're saying Great Britain? Yeah. Okay, answer is no. Yeah. Um, that's the second largest percentage of white Americans. They come from Great Britain, England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, all right? The largest percentage of, of white Americans are of German descent. Never knew that. Yeah. Yeah, check it out. Fact check me. So anyway, but regardless, all right? Let's say this. Are you a football fan? Okay. Um, just name me two teams. NFL teams? Yeah. Um, I'm not a football fan either. New York Giants. And what was the other one? Baltimore Ravens. Okay. So New York Giants and Baltimore Ravens uh, end up playing each other in the Super Bowl. Okay. Who wins? Anyone? Giants. Okay. Giants win. Okay. Keep that in mind. All right, so now back to my history lesson. <laughs> All right, so we went to war, we being America. We went to war against Great Britain. And we beat Great Britain, which is why we celebrate what? The 4th of July, Independence Day, right? There are plenty of white Americans in this country who descended from, descended from, from Great Britain. They have ancestry there. They can go back there today and find their third cousin removed or whatever, right? And they don't have any animosity towards their heritage. They, we, we love Great Britain now, all right? But these white Americans of British descent don't run out and build statues to King George III or fly the Union Jack. The loser does not get to build his statues or fly his flag on the winner's property, all right? which is why we fly the American flag on 4th of July, not the Union Jack, all right? Uh, we went to war against Japan when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. There are plenty of Japanese Americans in our country. There are, they are as American as you, I, or anybody else, all right? We did some terrible things to them, put them in internment camps and stuff, but these are Americans. They gave up their Japanese citizenship and became Americans. They love their ancestry in Japan, but they don't run out and build statues to Emperor Hirohito and fly the Japanese flag. Japan lost. Doesn't get to build his statues or fly its flag on the winner's property. We went to war against Germany in World War II, right? The bulk of Americans, white Americans, are of German descent. They don't run out and build statues to Adolf Eichmann and Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler and, and fly swastikas, unless, swastika flags, unless they are neo-Nazis or something like that. All right, so guess what? The Confederacy lost the war. They need to get over it. They don't get to build their stupid statues of uh, Confederate generals and fly Confederate battle flags on the winner's property. They lost. They can fly that flag, take that statue, put it in a Confederate m memorial museum, build a Confederate memorial park, fly your flag there, you know, build your statue there, go kneel beside it, plant flowers, do what you want to do. You don't fly the Confederate flag above the state capitol like they did in South Carolina. It does not represent every South Carolinian, all right? There's one flag for this, for this entire country, and we know what that is, all right? 
So they need to get over it and, um, and not build their statues and fly their flags. That needs to come down. I'm not saying take it down, tear it up, you know, destroy it. Put it in a museum, whatever. All right, now, back to the football. New York Giants win against the Baltimore Ravens. That means every New York Giant gets what? A Super Bowl ring. Do you also give Super Bowl rings to the, to the Ravens? Why? My point exactly. They don't get to build their statues or get their Super Bowl ring. Do you view race as a, and, and please correct me um, if I'm wrong. I swear I heard you speak about race as a culture. So I just want to know, do you view racism, that is, as a culture and a system, or you just view it as a culture? I view it as a system and, and a culture. But uh, it's the people who, who create the system. The people talk about systemic racism. All right? That's racism that's built into the system. Who put it in there? Man put it in there. Man is the one who runs the system. You know, if your computer makes a mistake, why? Because you programmed it. That's why. It didn't, it didn't decide on its own to make a mistake. Computers do what men have programmed into it. Men and women. I'm just using men as a generic term, right? Um, so, you know, if you want the system to change, if you want systemic racism to stop, then you've, then you've got to change the people behind the system. Uh, when you give your presentations, right, you talk about your experience, you speak about the importance of conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed with people who are good with stuff, being that you're a musician, sometimes you're unrealistic on other people's abilities to do stuff. Now, listen to, <laughs> listen to me right here. Yeah, right? I hear you. All right. So, um, you know, listening to you and listening to your stories, and people should listen to the uh, other stories, right? Um you have master communication skills, right? You have master listening skills. And I'll say that again, listening, which most people don't have. Um, you also have understanding, confidence, and patience that allows you to speak to someone who has opposing views, um, where the majority of people don't. And that's why I kind of disagree with your notion that people can have these conversations because, yes, you may be able to have these conversations because you are confident enough and have enough understanding where you can have an adult conversation with someone that opposes in view. You know, right, when you're talking to the average person and they disagree with your point, all these other emotions come into play outside of us speaking about that conversation. What are your thoughts about that? Okay, I believe you're 100% correct, okay? Um, yes, I had some advantages, um, through travel and, and through having the upbringing that I had, all right? Um, and listening skills. <laughs> Acknowledge the listening skills. Okay, listening skills. <laughs> listening skills. Okay, uh, and, and part of that I probably got through osmosis vicariously as a child because, you know, we, we were U.S. diplomats when we were overseas. My father's job with the American Embassy was to go to a foreign country and foster better relations with the foreign government, with our own U.S. government. That was my father's job. Just like the, my, my father was the second man under the, well, the first man right under the ambassador, so the second man in, in charge, all right? Um, so that, that's diplomacy. his job. Huh? Dipl di diplomacy is like in your DNA. Diplomacy, exactly. Yeah. So I was, I was around all kinds of people, um, presidents of countries, emperors, um, I met Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. Oh, we got to talk about that. Yeah, later. I met uh, President Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana. We got to talk about uh, that. Later. President Leopold Senghor of Senegal, President Sekou Toure of, uh, of Guinea, okay, and d various high level people um, because my father had to deal with them, you know? And, and so my, mo my mom taught English to President Senghor's wife, you know, because, you know, in, in Senegal they speak French. Uh, anyway, so just being a kid around all this, you know, you see how your parents interact with people. You see your parents sitting back and listening, you know, and so you, you absorb some of that. And dealing with different temperaments, you know. Yeah, but now to your point, yes, I agree. There are plenty of people who don't, um, you know, know how to sit back and listen without getting triggered and, and jumping in somebody's face or whatever because somebody said something that they find uh, offensive or simply wrong. One thing that we have to do, and that we all can do if we understand how it works, is this. You've heard the term or phrase, one's perception is one's reality. That is so true. 
Whatever somebody perceives becomes their perception, which becomes their reality. Even if it's not real, it's still their reality. And you, me, or anybody else cannot change somebody else's reality. We think we can, and that's why we say, no, you're wrong, because blah, blah, blah. We're trying to change somebody's reality. You cannot do that. Anytime you attack somebody's reality, you're going to get pushback because they believe what they think is right. It's their reality. And, and, and you are attacking it, so therefore they're going to defend. And if you continue, their defense is going to escalate. And it might, it might get to the point of violence. Okay? So never, here's how I operate. And, and I share this with your viewers and listeners to give them an, an alternative way of operating and they'll see how much better it works and they will achieve their goals even, all right? Rather than attack somebody's reality, offer them a better perception or better perceptions. And let me explain that to you. Let's say hypothetically, you have a little brother, seven or eight years old, and he goes to this magic show with his buddies. He comes back and tells you, Linton, you're not gonna believe this. This magician on stage, he asked for a female volunteer and 50 women raised their hand. And he picked one out of the audience, brought her up on stage, and he had her climb into this long box and stick her feet out the hole at that end and stick her head out the hole at this end. And then he closed the lid and he took a chainsaw and went right through the middle of the box. Brrr, saw came out the bottom of the box, wood flying everywhere. He cut her in half. And then he told her to wiggle her feet out the hole. And she wiggled her feet. And you said, listen, it, it could not have happened like that. It, it, you know, that. That really didn't happen like that. Yes, it did. I saw it. You weren't there. I saw it with my own eyes. I was there. He's 100% right. He saw it with his own eyes. You were not there. How dare you challenge my reality? I know what I saw. You're going to tell me I didn't see it? You weren't even there? Okay, so he's taking offense. You have challenged his reality. And to make it even more real to you, he tells you, after this man cut the uh, woman in half and she wiggled her feet, he took the half of the box with the feet and he moved it over here to stage right, took the half with the head and moved it over there to stage left. And then he walked over there and he talked to the lady's head and he had a conversation. She, she, she talked back with him. And then he brings the two halves back together. He does abracadabra over the box and then he opens the lid and this woman climbs out full form. He tells her, he cut her in half, he separated her, he brought her back together. He cut, and you say, listen, it's an illusion. No, it's not, I'm telling you, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. Everybody else in the place saw it. You were not there. Now he's getting pissed off because basically you're calling him a liar or something, right? You have attacked his reality and you've got him all triggered and escalated, his adrenaline's kicking in. He's gonna kick your butt in a minute, right? So. Rather than attack his reality, you offer him a better perception because you know one's perception becomes one's reality. His perception is, right now, his reality is based on his perception. He perceived the man cut her in half, separated her, brought her back together, and she was whole again. That's his perception, it became his reality. So what you do is you offer him a better perception. You say, listen, I hear you, but um, do you think that maybe it's possible, just perhaps, that you, know, you say he asked for a female volunteer and all these women raised their hand and he picked one out of the audience and brought her up on stage. Do you think that just maybe this particular woman works for him? Maybe she knows the trick and she travels all over the country with him and sits in that same theater seat every, everywhere they go. That way he can zero right in on her. He looks around and goes to her and brings her up on stage. And then, when he, and then when he asked her to climb in the box, there's already a pair of mannequin dummy legs laying on the floor of the box that are wearing the same stockings and same high heels that she has on. And, she, and he tells her to put her feet up the hole. She picks up the ends of those, of those poles, those legs, and shows them out the hole. And meanwhile, she brings her own knees up under her chest. So her whole body is over here in this side of the box. And when he says, wiggle your feet, 
just reaches over, shakes those poles, and the feet wiggle, right? And then when he separates the two, when he cuts the box in half, the saw never even touches her. Her whole body is there. When he separates the two boxes, those feet can no more move because she has no control over them. So he doesn't want you looking at those feet. He wants to steer your attention over here where, where there's no motion over there. So he walks over here to the head. Of course the head's going to talk back and your eyes are going to follow him. Yeah, that's right, you're not paying attention over there. And then when he brings her back and puts her together, she pulls those legs back in the box, leaves them there, and she climbs out. No blood. And then your brother says, hmm, you know, that might be the only way that could work. You've offered him a better perception and it resonated and now he's changed his own reality. That's how I affect change. I offer people better perceptions. I don't tell them, you're wrong. You know, give me your robe, you know, <laughs> whatever, right? Offer people a better perception. Don't get triggered and attack somebody's reality because all you're going to do is trigger them. We interviewed a, a legendary photographer, Chester Higgins, a while ago. And I'm paraphrasing, but he basically said he's in, he's has pictures of everyone, right? Mm -hmm. From Miles Davis, Muhammad Ali, everybody. He said Celestia had the strongest yeah. aura yes. he has ever he, experienced. He, yes. Did you and he has a, what, is, what is that about? He has... Um, he had a photographic memory too. Yeah, talk talk about. So hold on, before we get to the photographic memory, why do you think you've been around a lot of people yourself too, like brilliant people? Why is everyone talking about this aura that comes off of Celestia? Certain people have it. Okay, um, I'll tell you who has it. You know that I recognize instantly. Selassie had it. Um, Elvis Presley had it. Chuck Berry had it. Um, and somebody that I never really cared for, he had it, uh, Richard Nixon, President Nixon, all right? I walk into a room, I could feel it, all right? Some people just have a certain charisma, a certain aura around them. Sometimes it may be a negative aura for some people, like Nixon, or it could be a positive aura, like Elvis or Selassie or Chuck Berry. All right, what was your experience with Selassie? Okay, so... Uh, when I was a kid, we lived in, uh, in uh, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, uh, for four years. Uh, normally, you go to a country for two years, uh, that's your assignment, and then you come home, and then you go to another country for two years. We liked Ethiopia so much, uh, my dad asked the State Department to give him another two years there. Why did you like Ethiopia so much? The people, uh, the culture, just, we, just, we just liked it a lot. And, and we thought it would be great to, to extend our stay here. All right. Okay, so, um, you know, my, my dad's job at, you know, at the embassy, I said he was the second in command, um, was to foster better relations between the United States and the Ethiopian government. And so, of course, Selassie was, was the man, the emperor, and, you know, descendant of the Queen of Sheba and so forth and so on. So my, my, my father knew him, and um, I got to meet him. And you know, I was I was a young kid then. I have a picture of, of me and Selassie uh, as a kid. And um, so now, uh, fast forward about I don't know um, maybe seven or eight years later. Now imagine all the people he meets in a year. Which is a lot of people. It's pretty a lot of people. Yeah. Okay. Fast forward half a decade later. Um, we are in um, uh, Conakry, Guinea, all right? And um, Selassie comes to meet with, um, with uh, Sekuture, who is the president of, of, uh, of Guinea. And Kwame Nkrumah is there also. We, my father and a couple of other American officials, and my mom and I, we go to the airport to greet Selassie, as did many other ambassadors or whatever uh, from there from the various embassies come and they all are over there talking to Selassie and I'm standing back here with my mom so as I got done he walked over to me he walked over to me and started talking to me and says I remember you he remembered me from half a, uh, you know I, I have aged in five years yeah he remembered me um, the man was just I mean, it's hard, it's hard to, to, to even describe, you know, uh, how, do you, how, you, how, you, how do you describe an aura 
to someone who has not seen one, but you know it when it's there. You know, some people see auras. Um, I didn't see like a glow around him, like some people can see colors around somebody. I didn't see that. I felt it. I felt it. What did your father say about the brilliance of Celestia when he interacted with him? I think that's probably why he wanted to stay another two years as, as part of the reason. Uh, this guy was a great man, you know. Uh, he was done wrong. You know, the, the, the military killed him, you know, did a coup and, and took over. But um, I think Selassie, of course, at, the, at that age, I was not, you know, politi po politically cognizant of a lot of stuff. You know, I was just a kid. But, um, you know, a lot that I learned about Selassie came afterwards as, as an older kid, you know, a teenager and, and, um, and in, in, into my adulthood, you know. But, um, but I know that he was revered by a lot of Ethiopians and revered by our country as well yeah. at the time. What did you, how did your experience with, even though you were young, right? How did that experience differ from what you learned later? Because it seems like depending on who's writing the history, they could be pretty harsh on the narrative they gave yeah. us Celestia. Yeah. Um, I just know what I felt the two times that I met him. Uh, it was just kind of, you know, electrifying. Um, as you call it, the aura. Some people call it the charisma or whatever. Just, just his presence. And at that time, I met a lot of people. Um, later, I would meet uh, King Jordan of, um, of uh, I mean, sorry, K King Hussein of Jordan. Um, he was a very nice man, very nice man. Um, he didn't have that charisma that, that Selassie had, but he was a nice man. But I don't know how to explain it because I didn't really understand it. And, and I was used, you know, I didn't realize the importance of meeting all these people. This is just part of my dad's job. Uh, sort of like, you know, if you, if you were the son of, um, uh, you, you mentioned reggae um, music a minute ago. So let's just say you were, you were the son of Bob Marley or Peter Tosh. You, you know, as a kid, you would meet other famous musicians, whether they were reggae or rock and roll or whatever. You know, you would meet them on festivals or wherever your, your dad played. But you wouldn't think anything of it. It's just the norm for you. Right. So that was the norm. Meeting these people was the norm for me. Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah, the president of Ghana. Okay, so um, Kwame Nkrumah, he, had, um, he was the president of Ghana, a very influential uh, individual. And at one time... Um, he came to, uh, to Conakry, and he got off the plane and was arrested. And it was a Pan Am uh, flight, you know, Pan American Airlines. And because it happened on Pan Am, uh, Secretary, uh, Secretary was kind of a different kind of person. He banned Pan Am from, <laughs> from coming to Conakry. And... Um, he blamed a lot of things on a lot of, on, on a lot of people and a lot of places that were not responsible. Uh, for example, when, uh, I'm digressing for a second, when, I forgot, wh which Apollo was it that went up and blew up in the air and it killed the astronauts aboard? One, one of the Apollo missions, was it Apollo 11? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Or 13, whatever it was. Well, one, 11 or 13 landed on the moon, but one, but one of them blew up in the, in the, in the space. At the time, the Apollo went up and, um, and it blew up, killing the astronauts. And uh, we were living in Conakry, Guinea. And an outbreak of, um, of uh, pink eye broke out in Conakry. Secretary blamed it on the Americans for messing with the cosmos. He was punished, God was punishing you know, Earth. And so he put pink eye in, in Guinea. Another time, um, a Russian ship just happened to land in, well, not, you know, it was scheduled, but it, um, it landed in the Conakry port. And just by chance, at the same time, cholera broke out. He blamed it on the Russians. I guess he didn't believe you know, there was anything coincidental. And um, uh, when, when Nkrumah got arrested, um, the American embassy got kicked out of, uh, of Conakry because it happened on an American plane. 
uh, and then things went decrepit. And so we got invited back. And that's when we came, my, you know, my family. You know, the previous, um, the previous ambassador had gotten kidnapped and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, and then we were invited back because the Peace Corps was the one who kept the irrigation and all the things running and showing them how to, how to you know, repair things and all that kind of stuff, the infrastructure. So we came back and then um, right around the end of our two years, we had to leave. A lot of Americans had to leave real quick. Secretary had pretty much gone crazy. Uh, he was, he was taking, having the military take people out of their homes, not Americans, but uh, natives, you know, native um, Guineans. And he was hanging them, hanging them. Conakry is a peninsula and there's a bridge. I remember it, there's a bridge. And no matter where you go in Conakry, you must see that bridge. You either, you, you either have to go over the bridge, under the bridge, or around the bridge. But either way, you're going to see that bridge. So the people that he suspected of, of, um, of uh, being against him or whatever, he would have the military kidnap them out of their home, and he would hang them from the bridge. So everybody would see the, these, these hangings, and it would be a deterrent for them to, to speak out against uh, Secretary's government. All right, so we got the hell out of there. Um, anyway, uh, but while we were there, Nkrumah came, because uh, uh, he and, and Toure were, were, uh, were friends, and he was there when uh, Selassie came, and that's when I met him a uh, second time. I'm paraphrasing now when I say this, right? I once heard you say this country was built on a two-tier system, white supremacy and slavery. We spoke about it earlier. Um, for what I understand, uh, you believe the rise of white supremacist groups and acts of violence will reach its climax in America around 2042 right question that first question i have is um i need you to clarify something i see conflicting reports that say white supremacist groups are on the rise and extremely dangerous while other reports are saying white supremacist groups are declining and pose no threat based on your research and experience what is the truth truth is racism has always been here um Racism itself is not so much on the rise as people make it out to be. It's rising, but it's not rising by leaps and bounds. It's always been here. People are thinking, why are they acting like this? Uh, no, they've always been here. You know, you're seeing more of it. People have cell phone cameras, people, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the, what, what we're seeing more on the rise of are people who were already here but not coming out. Now we're seeing them come out and expose themselves. All right, we're seeing a lot more of that. They're taking off the mask. So now you know who they are, all right? That started, um, the taking off the, of the mask started um, during the Trump administration, all right? So we're seeing a lot more of that. But let me tell you what we're seeing in this country. You know, you mentioned 2042, all right? I learned about that in 1982, two years after I graduated college, I was 24 years old. I learned about it from the head of the American Nazi Party. I first met him when I was in high school, and then I encountered him eight years later, and I questioned him about things, and he told me about 2042. Real quick, how did you meet him? How did you meet him in high school? Okay, in 1974, we had a class in my high school called POTC, which stood for Problems of the 20th Century. It was a senior class for 12th graders, but I was taking it as a 10th grader. And our teacher, fantastic teacher, he would bring in different people to our class. Sounds like a great class. It was a fantastic class. I, I wish they, they, they'd bring it back, you know? So one day, uh, he invites um, the head of the American Nazi Party. You could never do that today. You know, we're talking about in the 1970s, right? So. I wish, I wish they would do it today. I wish they would, um, but they won't. Anyway, let me just give you a little bit of history about the American Nazi Party. It was created and founded by a fellow named George Lincoln Rockwell. George Lincoln Rockwell was a major supporter and proponent of the ideology of Adolf Hitler. He hated Martin Luther King. And every time King would have a march, George Lincoln Rockwell and his Gestapo would come and confront King. You can see pictures of it, and, you know, look, Google it or whatever. Anyway, big time anti-Semite, anti, anti 
and, um, and a racist. He was also a, I think, a Marine or Air Force, whatever, former veteran, Georgetown Rockwell. Well, anyway, uh, he got into an argument with one of his members, a guy named John Palter, who shot and killed Lincoln Rockwell. So uh, George Lincoln Rockwell's right-hand guy was a guy named Matt Cole, K-O-E-H-L. Well, Matt Cole is the one who took over after uh, Rockwell was murdered. Matt Cole is the one who came to my high school with his right-hand guy, a guy named Martin Kerr. And they're standing up there in my classroom, I'm 15 years old, espousing the views of white supremacy. Now, Cole was probably in his 40s then, because I was 15. And he pointed at me and pointed at my friend Herb, another black guy in the class, and said, we're going to ship you back to Africa. And then he went like this, and all you Jews out there, you're going back to Israel. So, oh, oh, hold on, what did, what did the teacher say? Nothing. You know, we, it's free speech. You know, you let this guy come and talk to your class. That's wild. But I'm glad. I'm glad. Okay, because that, that helped put me on that right trajectory. Now, yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm just sitting there like, you know, looking at this guy. I'm not saying anything to him. I, I can't believe what I'm hearing. I never heard an adult at that point talk like that. I'm just like, you know. And so one of my classmates um, said, they live here. You know, this, this, is, this is their home. W what if they don't want to go? And Matt Cole said, oh, they have no choice. If they do not leave voluntarily, they will be exterminated in the upcoming race war. That was the first time I ever heard the word or term race war. I'm thinking, what, what is this man talking about? Yeah, you know. And um, so later on that day, I'm standing beside my locker in the hallway. I'm the only one there. And Matt Cole and, and, um, and Martin Kerr are leaving. And they've been there all day because they have different POTC classes. So they have to walk down the hallway past me. I'm the only one in the hallway. They come and they see me and they stopped, you know, we're about even closer than you and I are. And they didn't say anything to me. They just kind of like sneered at me, you know, and then they started laughing and they went on down the hall, I guess out the front door because they were gone. And that put me on a trajectory to buy everything I could, every book I could find on black supremacy, white supremacy, the KKK, the Nazis, you name it. I want to learn about that ideology, and especially about this race war. Race war, uh, white supremacists, they call it Rahoa, R-A-H-O-W-A, Rahoa, which are the first two, it's an acronym, the first two letters of these three words, racial holy war, Rahoa. All right, look up Rahoa and you'll see race war. Um, they also call it the Boogaloo. Now, back in the 1960s, the Boogaloo was a dance. It's not a dance anymore, it's, it's the race war, another term for it. So anyway, um, I, you know, Music became, uh, two years later, I'm a senior, I graduate, I go to Howard University. Music becomes my profession, but studying race relations became my obsession. And there were no classes. It was not, you know, race 101, they don't, have, they don't even have that in college today, right? I had to self-educate, that's why I have all these books, all right? So <clears throat> I began going to a lot of um, anti-racist groups I, I would go to their meetings, I would just sit there in the back and listen and learn different things. And let me tell you something. Some of these anti-racist groups are as violent, if not more violent, than the KKK. So, like, how do they decide to execute their, their violence? Like, what's the... Oh, they, they, they come and confront a Klan march. They bring bricks and chains and baseball bats, and they try to break through police lines and attack these people. I've been there. I've seen it. All right? In fact... Um, uh, I might tell you something off camera later if you remind me. Uh, but anyway, um, they got a little too crazy and I stopped going to their meetings. Okay? And I'll tell you why off camera. But are, uh, anyway. Are they, um, are they organized or are they like yeah. splintered? No, it's groups? not like Antifa today where mm -hmm. there's it, a lot of disorganization, just random crazy acts oh, of violence. Oh, you said they're like really organized? Yeah. And are they really preparing for a race war? Or this is this really? Oh, you mean, like, the, you mean the Klan? You mean the, the no, white supremacists? The white supremacists. Yes. Because um, I saw so, some of them. Some of them are more organized than others. Yeah. Okay, but yes, they, they are expecting and they are prepping, that's what they call it, prepping. You said preparing, same thing, uh, for a race war. Yeah, yeah. Okay, because here's what's happening. Um, back to Matt Cole for a second, then we'll get, get, it leads to where you're going. Um, 
I, you know, I found out through different sources, you know, I became obsessed with this. I found out through different sources that the American Nazi Party was going to have an unpublicized, silent demonstration across the street from the White House one day. All right? There's a park right across the street from the White House called Lafayette Park. That's where you go if you want to protest. There are people there 24-7 every day of the year. Every day. Okay? Where there's nuclear weapons, the environment, abortion, you name it, somebody is there. So um, I, I understood that they were going to appear there. Nobody knows about it except the people that they tell. Not even the police don't even know about it, right? So I found out about it. Now, back then, you could drive up and down in front of the White House. You cannot do that today, okay? Only police cars. You can walk up and down, but you can't drive your vehicle because people have tried to run their vehicle through the gates of the White House. All right, so they just block that off. Um, so I go down there early. I park, catty corner to the White House, and I only live 35 minutes from the White House. So I wait. Here comes this van. And 13, 15 of these American Nazis get out. There's Matt Cole and Martin Kerr, the same two guys who came to my school eight years ago, right? And uh, Matt Cole is getting everybody lined up on the sidewalk. There's nothing that indicates they're Nazis. No Gestapo uniforms, no swastikas, SS, nothing. Just dark black suits. And they're standing like this, facing the White House, right? Now, the White House knows who they are. Nobody else knows who they are, I guess. So it's lunchtime. People are walking. It's D.C., crowded. People are walking back and forth. You know, you, know you, you see them, but you don't know who they are. I know who they are. And then down here is some guy sitting in a, t in a little tent. That, you know, he's protesting whatever he's protesting. Anyway, not related to the Nazis. So I wait for Matt Cole to get all situated, and then he's in the line like this. I got out of my car. I walked over, and I said, Matt Cole. You see, I felt the need to confront him. Because at age 15, I did not confront him. Now I need to confront him. So I said, Matt Cole. He like jumped in the line like, who is this black person who knows my name? He goes, do I know you? And I said, well, you spoke at my high school. And he said, what high school is that? I said, Wooten High School. He goes, oh, yes, yes, yes. I remember you. What can I do for you? He goes, that was a long time ago. I said, yes, eight years ago. He goes, yes, yes, I remember. What can I do for you? I said, well, do you remember what you told me? He goes, I, I recall. And I said, well, I'm still here. And he says, well, I can see that. How, how can I help you? I said, well, you can tell me just who the hell gives you the authority to make permanent travel arrangements for me. He looked at me, he goes, well, what's your name? I said, Daryl Davis. He put his hand out, he shook my hand. And then he did something that, that, that I've used before on other people, and it's, it's pretty effective. He held my hand tight with this hand and kept shaking it. And then he shook his finger from his other hand in my face. And he said, Mr. Davis, you have to understand one thing. It is in the interest of your race, the black race, to be a strong race. And you cannot be a strong race unless you are a pure race. And you cannot be a pure race if you are miscegenating with other races. It is in the interest of my race, the Aryan race, which is what he calls the white race, to also be a strong race. And, and we are becoming a, a mongrel race by miscegenating with mud races such as yours. So anybody, anybody who's non-Aryan is a mud race, all right? That's the thing I don't understand to this Aryan, not to deter you from your argument, but what do they mean by Aryan? Like what is the Aryan race? Because they're not all from the same ethnic background. I'm right, pretty sure. Right. So what do they mean by Aryan race? Pure, pure white. Pure white. Pure white, God's chosen people. All right. I guess and, you know, and that's, that's their reality, right? All right. Okay. So, so anyway, you know, we're talking, talking, and um, he told me you know, the races could not coexist in this country until they learn they cannot blend. So until that point, they cannot coexist. So, you know, I wasn't there to beat him up. I was there to, to learn from him, to learn where does this craziness come from. And then he began telling me about 2042. Now, he told me a lot of lies, but... <laughs> What he told me about 2042, he was right. Because I've been following it ever since 1982, all right? When this country, as I said before, has been built on a two-tier society, white supremacy at the top and slavery at the bottom, all right? And as we progress through the years, you know, we may have progressed like this, but never like this, all right? Um, 
when I, I'll be 66 week after next. Yeah. And when I was a child, the black population in this country was 12%. Native Americans, 1%. Uh, Hispanic, Latino Americans, almost 2%. Asian Pacifica Americans, almost 3%. Whites were like 86, 87%, all right? The census is taken, and you can fact check it, go to uscensus.gov, it's taken every 10 years, every decade, yeah. all right? Today, Black people remain around 12%. We're 129 so they say 13 So we have not grown. Native Americans remain at 1%. Uh, Asian Americans have grown almost double. They're almost at 6%. Uh, Latino Hispanics have more than quadrupled, 17 point something percent. So if you take, oh, if you take just um, black people, 12%, and Latino Americans, 17, that right there is 29% non-white. That's almost a third, right? Today, white people only make up almost 60% of the population. This is happening, yeah. all right? It is predicted in the year 2042, for the first time in our history, this country will be 50-50. It may be, it may be quicker because- uh, Yeah, it's just a, yeah, a projection. Yeah, no, I understand, but I was just saying like, uh, I had a conversation with a previous guest and like, collectively, mm -hmm. right? Not collectively. It seems like white people in America in a very bad state. Or what? In a bad state, collectively. Yeah, in a bad state in terms of population. Population, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because, you know, um, globally, whites are a minority. In this country, they're a majority, all right? Um, you know the term white flight. Does, doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Because, you know, the color of our landscape has changed so much. Anywhere they go, there's already somebody there that doesn't look like them, right? So they're freaking out about that. And there, there, there's a large percentage of white people in this country that don't care about that demographic shift. They shouldn't care and they don't care. Say, so, hey, that's evolution, I don't have a problem with that, no big deal. But there's a slice of our population that does care. And those are the ones that I deal with. And they're the ones that tell me they don't want their grandkids to be brown, all right? And they repeat exactly what Matt Cole told me back in 1982, uh, you know, the browning of America and all that kind of crazy stuff. They, um, will they inflict violence on a white person who's in an interracial yes. relationship? Yes, they will hate that white person more than, than the black person. But will they inflict violence? Will they? Yeah, they will? absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know what I noticed? Because we're on the East Coast, we're kind of blocked off from a lot of the physical actions of racism. We may experience like, you know, denial of a job or a slur, mm -hmm. but when you're in these areas, you don't actually see that physical uh, display of racism like you would in other areas, you know? Uh, I don't know so much about that. You disagree? Um, yeah, it, it can happen anywhere. Look at Charlottesville, that's the East Coast. Um, look at um, uh, J um, Mobile, uh, Alabama, where they hung Michael, Mc hung Michael McDonald. Should, Michael I say, McDonald. should I say metropolitan cities then? Yeah, maybe metropolitan cities, okay? Like East Coast. Right? But, uh, yeah, but you know what? Uh, you saw an act of racial violence in, a metro in, 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 in the New most York. powerful yeah, yeah. metropolitan city in the world, Washington, D.C., January 6, 2020, the insurrection. That was a lot of racial violence. You saw somebody walking through the Capitol Rotunda carrying the Confederate battle flag. You saw somebody else in the Capitol Rotunda wearing a Camp Auschwitz t-shirt. You don't have to ask them what they want. That's what they want to go back to. That's the make America great again. Okay, so that was, there was a lot of violence that day. How many people did you see on January 6th breaking through windows and kicking down doors and beating up police officers that looked like me or you? DC is two thirds black. How come there weren't more black people there? Yeah, so anyway, uh, these people are fearing. They know 2042 is going to be a demographic change. And between 2045 and 2050, it's going to flip. And for the first time, whites will become the minority in this country. And that's what this group of people is afraid of. They're afraid if, if that were to happen, that these people are going to seek revenge on them for all the centuries of injustice. And so they're preparing for the race war. And you know, one thing I want to add to their ideology about race war, they're taking their 
perspective and putting it on someone else. Yes, of course. Because they've been so violent and like other people don't think like that. So even though they may be in a position of power, I really doubt they're going to deal with them like white people have dealt with other people. I think that's one of the issues that they're projecting their uh, idea. Well, you know, h- how do you gain control of people? Yes. You put fear into them. You're the one who can alleviate their fear. And we're seeing a certain candidate try to do that. In fact, uh, he said the other day there's going to be a bloodbath if he didn't win. So you're trying to scare somebody. They're bringing rapists and murderers and drugs across the border. We don't have rapists and drugs and murderers here already. Uh, Homegrown, (laughs) you know. Highest quality. (laughs) Right. Why Why are white and black people in so much denial about racism in this country? Denial in terms of what? Its existence and its impact on people's lives. Some people think if you don't talk about it, then it won't exist. Some people are too young and too dumb to know the history, their own history of, of racism uh, in this country. And so you only know what you know. So if you've not experienced it and you have not seen it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just simply means that you have not experienced it and you have not seen it. All right. Um, it's sort of like, uh, I'll give you an example. If we pinpoint, let's just agree to pinpoint the beginning of the civil rights movement, let's just say 1955 with Rosa Parks, Emmett Till, through 1968 with Dr. King. All right. So it starts there and the first wave of civil rights movement ends in 68 with King's assassination. During that time from 55 to 68, we made progress. But the pages of progress turned very slowly. Why? Because the powers that be, which is the white establishment, when they would look at our marches, our protests, our boycotts, our sit-ins, our demonstrations, what did they see? They saw a large ocean of black people doing these demonstrations and so forth and marches. They saw a smattering, a few white people mixed in. But those white people, they're, they're race traders, they're nigger lovers, they're, you know, undesirable, you know. So they just shut their ears, shut us down. We still made progress, but it was slow. Yeah. All right? Now, fast forward 2020. We see a black man being lynched on the sidewalk by four police officers of the Minneapolis Police Department. And one of them is choking him to death very slowly by putting his knee on the man's neck, all right? This was during the height, or not the height, but the beginning. Uh, I say height because more people died then than later, but um, the, uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Nobody was, was going out. Everything was shut down. People could not go to work, could not go to school. They're home. What are they doing when you're home? You can't go out. You watch TV, you surf the internet, and what do you see? you see a live lynching going on. It's being streamed, right? And we've seen it before. We've seen it in person. We've heard about it. We've had family members or friends who have had these encounters. We know somebody. If we don't know the person directly, we know somebody who knows somebody who's been assaulted by a police officer, all right? But for white people, that's not the norm. They don't see that like we see it every day. They don't experience it like we experience it. And they're at home because they can't go out and they're, they're seeing this. Like, oh my God, oh my, I can't believe this is happening. Why isn't somebody doing something? Why is he on this person's neck? The man says he can't breathe, blah, 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 blah. Why? They don't understand it. And, but many of them thought, I gotta do something. I, I, I gotta do something. The man dies. What did they do? They came out despite the risk the health risk, people dying every day by the thousands, and then it got to be three million people dying, right? They came out, these white people, despite the risk to their own health during a major pandemic that we'd never seen in centuries. They exposed themselves to this pandemic to to come out and march with us. And what did the powers that be now see? They saw an ocean of black people, an ocean of white people, 
marching together for the same cause. Now they couldn't shut us down. Their ears open. You know, you, you don't care about four or five white people. You know, that you just write them off as you know, in bed with those black people. But when that many white people are doing something with the black people, maybe I better take a look. Maybe I better listen. All right. So now they're listening. As a result, those pages of progress turned a lot faster. All right. Those protests, those marches of 2020, whether they were Black Lives Matter or anybody else, were geared predominantly towards police departments across this country, specifically towards Minneapolis police. All right. However, it had a larger residual effect than we've ever seen before. Police officers were being charged, uh, arrested, convicted, and, and imprisoned. Boom, 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 like that. All right, we'd never seen that before. 20 years ago, you never would have even heard the name Derek Chauvin. Derek who? What do you do? I, I didn't hear anything about that. You never would have, you never would have heard about George Floyd, all right? Um, go ahead, okay. I, I just have a question. How mm -hmm. do you quantify like progress? When you say progress, what do you mean by progress? Okay, well, I'm, I'm showing you. So the fact that police officers today are being charged and convicted. Held accountable more. Huh? They're held accountable more. They're for being own. held to what they should have been held accountable for all, for, for throughout our existence, <laughs> you know? Um, like Rodney King's cops you know, that beat him, they were acquitted. All right? So anyway, um, so that's progress. But I'm saying we even saw a larger residual effect Back to the Confederate flag, the Confederate battle flag, NASCAR, which was the, the ground zero. Everybody came to NASCAR with the Confederate flag, man. NASCAR banned flying that flag on their property, despite the fact that they were going to lose some hardcore fans. I'm not going there anymore. You know, they're, they're, they're in, you know, they, they've, they've flipped or something like that. NASCAR didn't care. They didn't want it. All right. That's progress. All right. Uh, Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben. The, uh, the food uh, brand, changing the labels, that's progress. Um, the state of Mississippi, or as they call themselves, the sovereign state of Mississippi, removed the Confederate flag out of their main flag body because it had that, that, that flag in there, in, embedded in their flag, right? Who would have thought Mississippi, of all places, would take that out? Mississippi was one of those states that had segregated proms even just a couple years ago. Word? Yeah, yeah, look it up. That's crazy. Yeah. Okay. They removed that Hold portion. On. In the 21st century, yes. they had segregated yes. proms? Yeah. Yeah, j just a couple years ago. One place was uh, Pearl, Mississippi had it. Okay. So, anyway, um, that, that's, that's progress. That's progress. So, what, what is the main difference between the first, from the first civil rights nationwide protests and the ones of 2020? The makeup of the protesters. The collaboration of whites and blacks caused that progress to accelerate. And that's what we need to focus on, to, to expose people to history, expose people to what's going on in our country, make them aware. When they become aware, their better conscience comes into play. Like I said, you know, we were fighting for our lives, all right? So, pan, you know, either the cops are gonna kill us or the pandemic's going to kill us. White people, they didn't have to fight for their lives. You know, they already have a life. They're not worried about being pulled over and, and having their, their, you know, their, their breath choked out of them with, with, a, with a knee on their neck for, for maybe uh, passing a $20 bill that was fake. We don't even know today if that $20 bill was fake. All right? Um, because that man never got his chance in court. I, I can, look, let me, let, me, let, me, let me look in my... In my uh, pocket right now. Let's see here. This is my wallet, right? I got a hundred dollar bill here. I got a five dollar bill. I got a twenty dollar bill. Okay. Now, where did I get this twenty dollar bill and this five dollar bill? I had I had another hundred dollar bill in here. But I broke it somewhere. I paid for something with my hundred dollar bill and I got some twenties back. Right? Do I can, can I, can I personally look at this $20 bill and tell if it's fake? I don't know. I, I'm not trained to, to, to see what, what constitutes real and fake in money, okay? A store clerk is supposedly trained in that. So the store clerk 
um, thought he detected something odd with that $20 bill that Mr. Floyd gave him, right? So he did the right thing. This man, this might be a fake $20 bill, let me call law enforcement. So he did the right thing. I'm not faulting the store clerk. I'm faulting the law enforcement that came and didn't do the right thing. They should be able to tell, but if they, if they don't tell, then arrest the man, take him to jail, give him his day in court, get a, call somebody from the bank, is this a, a, a counterfeit $20 bill? If it is, okay, it was in his possession, um, where'd you get it? Oh, I don't know, I got it at 7-Eleven, whatever. All right, maybe he's telling the truth. You don't know. That's why you have court. Court determines whether you're innocent or guilty. But rather than, than um, give him his due day in court, you decide that, it's, it, that he's passing a counterfeit $20 bill and you're gonna kill him for it. You're gonna punish him. That's a lynching. Yeah. What, if you look up the definition of lynching, it's when a mob of three to four or more people take somebody out of the system and, 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 and exact justice on them uh, themselves, okay? And you know, it used to happen in the South, the sheriff's deputy would leave the jail unlocked, yeah. the mob would come in, get the guy, and take him to a tree, all right? There's no difference between choking a guy by the neck hanging from a tree or choking him on the sidewalk with your knee on his throat. Yeah. He's still being choked to death. Three or four people, there were four cops there, that's a lynching. It's not a homicide, it's a lynching, okay? So anyway, um, the lesson learned, when we wanna see progress, what, like I said, those white people didn't have to come out. They're staying safe in their house from, from catching something called COVID-19, coronavirus 19, or COVID-19, or COVID as we call it today, right? They could have stayed safe and just continued watching TV and gotten on with their lives. That's our problem but they came and joined us. And as a result, progress happened a lot faster. Things began changing, names, uh, statues began coming down, names of buildings named after slave owners began getting changed to, uh, to new names. That's progress. We never saw that kind of progress from 55 to 68. Have black people criticized you for your work? And also, how has white law enforcement responded to you? But deal with the black people first. Have you received criticism? from black people for the work you've done. Absolutely. And I, I've, I've received criticism from white people too. Um, well, I wanna hear but, what the black people say. Yeah, okay. Now, I also have a lot of black supporters as well. But um, yeah, there's some people who just don't understand. And the biggest criticism, you know, I've been called an Oreo, an Uncle Tom. I've been called every name but my own. But um, I say, you know, they don't understand. They tell, the, the biggest complaint is, it's not your job to teach white people how to treat us. I disagree, and I'll tell you why I disagree. Because we've been treated the same way for 400 years. So maybe it's the way we're teaching them or not teaching them. At least what I'm doing is working. It may be working very slowly, it may be one at a time or something, but uh, you know, the same people who, who, um, who call me a race traitor, a sellout, Uncle Tom, Uncle Ruckus, and whatever else they call me, um, these are the same ones who go and protest in front of police departments and yell and scream that these are racists in the police department shooting black men and, and causing their death when they are unarmed, et cetera. And they're right. They're right. Okay. I'm not, I'm not, you know, um, condemning what they do. And I asked them, do you believe the people, you know, with their bullhorns in front, in front of the police department, yelling and screaming and marching around in a circle around the police department and holding up signs, no justice, no peace, hands up, don't shoot, all this kind of stuff to these white police officers who are racist. Not all of them, but some of them are. Because um, I know some of them. Anyway, I say to them, do you believe they're racist in that police department? Yeah, yeah, they're white supremacists, yeah. Well, you're standing here telling them, don't shoot, hands up, don't shoot. You know, I'm a man, treat me equally, blah, blah, blah. You're trying to teach them how to treat you. What is the difference between your teaching a white supremacist in a uniform with a badge and a gun than me teaching a white supremacist with a uniform and a hood, a robe and a hood? What's the difference? And guess what? One of those, uh, there are more, but one of those police officers in the Baltimore City Police Force was the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. 
what, and today what I have his uniform, his Robin Hood, and his police uniform. What year was his tenure? Uh, in the uh, 1970s and 80s. That's crazy, man. Yeah. So, you know, I think people who criticize me like that, because I'm teaching somebody how to treat us, is hypocritical. You're doing the same thing. You're teaching white supremacist police. I'm teaching white supremacist Klan. They're still white supremacists. And what is, um, have you received any harassment from like white police officers that know about you? Uh, no, no, but um, I, I've talked to a lot of them, you know, and I know some who are very racist and I've, talk, I've had words with them, but no, they, they haven't really, you know, really harassed me per se. And uh, last part now, you speak to people, they leave the Klan, right? I don't know how you would like follow up on this, but like, how is their relationship with black people? I know they left the Klan, right? Yeah. But has their mind shifted in regards to their view of black people? Many of them have, yeah. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, and, and for some it's a work in progress. Okay, because you know, they didn't Life grow up that way. And so now they're trying to re enter into another world. They can't go back because they've already betrayed their family. Right? Um so you know, they're a sellout now, right? So now they're having to re-enter. And it's very, very important that when somebody comes out that you are there to support them, give them that anchor because they've been rejected by, by, their, by their clan family or their white supremacist family. And it's possible they've been rejected by their own biological family, uh, either because they're associating with black people or because this biological family uh, was never racist to begin with. Their child became racist. And so they disowned the kid because the family has Jewish friends, black friends. You can't have your kid over at your house and invite your, 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 your Jewish or black friends over. You'd be afraid that the kid's gonna say something stupid to one of them and then they'll ruin your reputation. So you just, you know, hey, you know, if, if you can't respect people, then you get out of my house, that kind of thing. So you've been disowned by this family and now you betrayed that family. You're out here swinging in the wind by yourself. You wanna to belong to something and, and you have no friends anymore. All your friends from high school who didn't join the Klan, they don't want to associate with you, right? And there's a stigma. There's, there's a stigma um, that goes along with being an ex-white uh, supremacist. Um, I should have brought some water to drink with me. But uh, anyway, um, it's sort of like, I'm your friend, all right? And if I call you up and say, hey, Linton, man, you're not going to believe this. You know, I, I, was, I went to the bar, had a few drinks last night, and I was on my way home. Man, I was only two blocks from the house, man. This cop pulled me over and gave me, a, you know, arrested me for DWI. Um, and gave me a ticket or whatever. I got arrested. I got out this morning on, on my own recognizance or whatever. You're still going to be my friend. You know, okay, I got a DWI. I got a record. All right? You're still going to be my friend. You know, you might chastise me and say, you know, you need to cut back on your drinking. Don't, you know, if you're going to drink, man, you know, call me. I'll drive you your designated driver, whatever, but you're not going to abandon me. But if, um, if, if I call you and say, hey, man, you know, I got arrested, I shot somebody, I got pissed off or I raped somebody or something like that, you're going to be like, Whoa. <laughs> don't be calling me anymore. <laughs> you know, you, there's, a, there's a stigma. Well, you know, if you look at, at a Klan person or, or a neo-Nazi or whatever, white supremacist, um, who's gotten out, it will always say, former Klan leader, ex-KKK, ex-neo-Nazi, blah, blah, blah. It always has that, that prefix to it. It's like they don't want to let go. Not, not, not the Klan person, he's trying to put that behind him. But the media always refers back to that. You know? Um, and they're trying to, to erase their, not erase, but put their past behind them. You move on, right. So there's a stigma that goes along with it. And so you need to be there if you know if if you're if you help somebody get out or whatever, be there for them until they get back grounded on their feet, because like I said, you, they can't go back. You you you've already betrayed that family and this family's already disowned you, so you're out there by yourself. You, chances are you're going to get involved in some other crazy thing. Well, I appreciate you coming, man. I really my pleasure, lot, man. man. Thank you for having me. Man. Let's, let's call this part one. We'll do a part two sometime. All right, cool, cool, cool. Thank you so much. All right.